So, hi again. I'm back with a little tutorial and a little philosophical discussion which programming language you should use for your data science project. So we have R, Python and Scala as choice. And actually I can tell you from my experience you are doing best if you are using all of them. And let me just show why and how to use them. I will illustrate this with a little example. It's a real project where I've been involved, but of course I cannot use real data. Therefore I have taken data from NASA and this is a little test data set which NASA has created by attaching accelerometer sensors for measuring vibration and also by attaching temperature sensors to a bearing and they did a accelerated degradation by just putting a tremendous amount of pressure to the bearing. So let's have a look at this setup. So in order to use this data set we have to cite uh, their publication and I will just cite their publication down in the description of this video. But it's an experimental platform for Bearing Accelerated Life Test, IEEE International Conference on Prognostics and Health Management in Denver, Colorado, USA, 2012. The authors have been Neto, Guribo, Mejaha, Ramasso, Morello, Zehoni and Vanier. Okay, so this is done and this, this uh, setup has been taken from their publication. So that's basically what you see here is a, a motor and that motor basically turns the bearing and uh, there is a cylinder pressure which actually creates a lot of force against the bearing by rotating and you have uh, accelerometers as already said and you have a temperature sensor. So that's basically all. Those are the most, most important parts of this setup. And what you then basically get is data from, from this setup. It's accelerometer data and temperature data. And the way they have sampled the accelerometers is a bit special. So they have sampled every 10 seconds a time window of 100 milliseconds. That's important to, to notice. And the rest is pretty straightforward. So this data is available in the internet. So in order to start, we just start our data science experience. We sign in and we don't need any storage on the local machine. We will do everything in the cloud. So there's no issue with bandwidth for transferring the data or with uh, storing the data. Everything is just in the cloud, okay? So we'll start a new project, which we call NASA. And we will use the already provisioned Apache Spark service. And what we also do is we use our local cloud object storage, which is based on OpenStack Swift. We click on create. And within that project, we create a notebook. And this notebook is a Scala notebook, but we don't specify that because we just download a Jupyter notebook from my GitHub repository. And what we basically do is we click on developer works. That's a project where I store all my snippets in. And this Bearing NASA folder contains those three notebooks. We will start with the Scala notebook. And once this is loaded, we have to click on RAW because we need the link for the RAW file. It's a JSON object, basically, this whole file. And in order to import it, we need a link to the RAW file. So click on RAW. And once it opens, we basically just copy and paste the link. So we paste the link to this text field called notebook URL and we give it a name. So the kernel type, which is of type Scala, is stored within the notebook. So data science experience and Jupyter automatically know which type of kernel and which type of Spark version has to be used. This is shown at the top right hand side. So we are now connected 
and the kernel is ready and we can basically start to execute the cells. So the first cell just sets up the connection to the OpenStack Swift storage. So the second cell basically imports the Scala system process package. It's pretty interesting because you can basically just stop your command with an exclamation mark and it will be executed as a Unix command line. And since we are running in a Docker container inside Kubernetes here, we can basically just download any file from the internet. And that's what we are doing here. So we are just downloading a zip file. And we will see the progress. That's ordinary Unix command line output what we are seeing here but inside the Jupyter Notebook, so no need for SSH and using another tool. And also this output will be preserved in case we export this notebook. That's pretty cool. So let's wait a bit. And it's pretty fast, as you can see, because it's all running in the cloud. No need for any internet connection. So that's the size. It's 140 megabyte, 5.24 megabyte per second. And that's basically a view of the staging area. At the moment we have 66 terabytes of memory and then what we do is we unzip and you see there are a lot a lot of files all CSV files containing accelerometer and temperature data and the cool thing is you can basically now use with files of, of size of 60 terabytes. There's no, no issue. And we cannot do that simply on, on, on a little laptop or so. And the uh, storage technology behind that is called GPFS. It's a cluster file system which IBM makes available for the data science experience users. So once we have extracted all those files, we can basically create a Apache Spark data frame out of the complete folder. And we even can basically tell via a wildcard that it should only pick up accelerometer data and we basically skip temperature data for now. So basically we pass the infer schema option to the Spark read method and then we basically define the wildcard and it infers the schema. So this is running now. And as you will see later, the schema is inferred. So it will automatically find out what data type is behind all those columns in the CSV file. But there's no way in, in getting the exact column names, but we will fix that later. So this is finished now. Task number 15 has been finished. And let's print the schema of this newly created data frame, which we have created out of this folder containing CSV files. So we can see that there are three integers and one decimal and two double fields. We have three used for the timestamp and actually also the fourth one is a timestamp and then we have the two dimensions for the accelerometer. We skip deleting the old file now and we basically just create a view. So this is the create or replace temp view command of Apache Spark so that we can run SQL statements against this data frame. So let's run this. So basically we create a cluster ID. I will come back to that later why we need that cluster ID. Then we create a timestamp. That's a bit a complex statement. And then we basically rename C4 and C5 as horizontal and vertical acceleration. And then we basically check what's inside our result of the SQL statement by just seeing how many clusters have been created. So that looks pretty fine. And then what we do is we basically only store the contents of this data frame into a file in the OpenStack Swift storage. And in order that we recognize that we are working on our file, we will just rename that to underscore YouTube. And then we run the cell, we wait a bit, and then we have completed the ETL, the extract transform load process within a notebook using Scala. So Scala is a very nice language for creating ETL processes because it has static type checking and it's something which you can run on a repeated basis. So every night at three o'clock, for example. And that's actually what we also can do inside this notebook by just clicking on that clock symbol. 
the scheduler opens and then we give this job a name and then we select a time so let's do that in the morning and maybe at 3 a.m. So this will run now every night at 3 a.m. on a daily basis and we just click on schedule and then we can basically forget everything about it because now it's everything managed for us. We just receive an email if something fails, which is nice. So done. And let's go to the next file or the next notebook, which is a Python notebook. Okay, we click on the project again, then we click on add notebook. And again, we click on from URL. So let's give this notebook a name, exploratory visualization or something. Let's go back to my GitHub repository and let's click on the Python notebook and again, click on raw. And then finally we can obtain the URL to the raw file of the Python notebook which we then can use to import this notebook into data science experience. So we copy and we paste and we click on create notebook. That's all. So now we have to run this cell that initializes the connection to the OpenStack Swift storage. Let's actually read the underscore YouTube file, which we have created in the Scala process before. So we see here that the Apache Spark process gets triggered. It has 88 tasks, so it's highly parallelizable. And once this is done, we will basically see the first 20 uh, rows. And then we import Pixie Dust. So Pixie Dust is a data science visualization library, which has been implemented and developed by the IBM Watson cloud team, but it's open source. So it's a very cool library because you can throw in any type of data frame Python Pandas or R or Apache Spark. And in the case of Apache Spark, it takes care of downsampling out of the box. So there's no need for you to downsample the data before you actually visualize it. And it's an interactive visualization. So let's have a look how this looks like. So the first thing which we are seeing is basically a sample table of the data frame. And once we are seeing this table, we can basically have a look at it and then create a visualization out of those data. So let's click on the chart symbol and we select line chart. And what now happens is this is picked up from my last one. Normally you have to specify that the columns which you are using, but what is happening now is it's rendering a little time series plot using the horizontal and vertical accelerometer data. So here you can see which columns I have used. So I used the time series column which is a continuous number as the value for the x-axis and I have used horizontal and vertical acceleration for the y-axis. And uh, that's basically all I need. I can switch from subplots to grouped and then everything will be contained in only one chart. And I can even change the rendering engine from Bokeh to Matplotlib if I like this better. And what I also can do is I can also choose among multiple types of visualizations, which is pretty cool. And I can also download the data or store it to a cloud storage. So Python lies in the intersection of Scala and R in my opinion, because if you are coming from a Java or Scala background, you can easily learn and pick up Python. And even if you're coming from a mathematical background, coming from MATLAB or R, you can learn Python pretty straightforward. So you can basically do much more in Python. But now I want to show you how you can use R in conjunction of data science experience and Spark as well for doing some heavy lifting of the data and also some advanced visualizations and algorithms. So we will now click on the project again and then we create a new notebook. So we have to go back to my GitHub project and we select the R Jupyter Notebook and click on raw again, copy the link and paste it. We call it freaky stuff with R and then we don't have to select R because it's inside the JSON object. So we paste the URL, 
click on create notebook then this notebook gets prepared for us we have to run the first cell in order to set up the connection to the OpenStack Swift storage and the second line basically will create a spark data frame using R code for us okay that's pretty interesting because now you can mix and match spark and R so what we are actually seeing is the same table which we are used to already and let's count the number because now we are not using pixie dust anymore we need to have an idea of how big our data set is and it's uh, 7 million rows and now let's down sample that a bit we can do that using SQL because if we are using SQL against the Apache Spark data frame this runs in parallel on the cluster and not within the R session because usually what R sessions are tend to do is they crash so it's better we use Apache Spark and we call now n row on the data frame this n row function is overloaded so you are used to it using it in conjunction with the R data frame but if you pass the Spark data frame it also works so we have only 700,000 rows and let's collect those that means we are actually copying the data frame from Spark into the R session so we are really brave we are copying 700,000 data points into our R session if you want to know why I'm talking like this just check out this video so this is done and let's check the column names again so we are fine so let's plot the horizontal acceleration this will take some time it will take actually a lot of time so I'm fast forwarding now because we are in our session and we are trying to plot 700,000 data points maybe we should have down sampled a bit more anyway this is done now this looks pretty cool because actually we want to forecast failures of bearings and we can clearly see that there is some sort of a threshold of uh, accelerometer values which we can use so let's have a look at a vertical acceleration maybe this will give us a bit more insight uh, or will yield to a better threshold value again I have to fast forward because it's so slow if I'm using R and actually as you can see it's even looking better because this way we can really really easily create a threshold and predict a certain point in time where the bearing is about to fail very soon but let's have a look if we can do some feature engineering and use using the mean and standard deviation of those two dimensions we do this using SQL again because then we can push the load to Apache Spark and don't stress our R session too much and again we collect back the data which will take some time and that's the basically the aggregated view of our data where we have calculated mean and standard deviations for the two dimensions and the size of the data set is uh, far lower and if we plot that now let's have a look what happens I think we have to find out where this first peak comes from but we can clearly see that the second peak also gives us some sort of a clear threshold but I guess that it's not better than the one which we obtained from the raw data have a look at the mean of the other dimension that doesn't really help us so let's actually do one one further thing we do some time to frequency transformation and we are doing that using wavelets and it's even more sophisticated time to frequency transformation than discrete Fourier transformation and we are doing that using pure R because that basically is the strength if we are using R in conjunction with Spark we can use all the packages which we have in R and we can basically see that we have obtained some very nice features from those data points and I will leave that to the next tutorial where we will actually use fast Fourier transformation, wavelets and gradient boosted tree in order to predict the failures of the bearings. So stay tuned for the next tutorial, subscribe to my YouTube channel and I wish you all the best.